Hello everyone and welcome to Jeff G tonight and we are reconnecting with an old friend of the show, Bill Gad. It's great to have him. How are you doing, Bill? I'm doing fine, JF. I hope you're doing it just as well. <laughs> so you had been attracting a lot of attention on our show back in the days and I stopped receiving guests for many years. Well, for a year <laughs> approximately because I was annoyed with YouTube censorship and the guests weren't uh, up to up to date and following the YouTube rules. But now I'm on Odyssey and I've been successful at transferring my audience here. And so it's great we can have discussions again. We can talk with guests. So today is a day of freedom. And as I've announced uh, before earlier in the week, it's the day of the rope. We'll be talking about the rope hypothesis again. <laughs> Has it been uh, progressing? And for those who have not heard about it, uh, what does it consist of? Well, um, the rope hypothesis, here, here it is, in a nutshell, okay, mm -hmm. we're saying that, uh, we're proposing that all atoms are interconnected by a rope-like entity, a pair of twine threads, think of DNA, in fact, I think that uh, DNA copied the model from the rope, Okay, mm -hmm. that, that's my take on that because they're all twined, you know, and uh, but I, I think we have to take a step even further down because uh, what I'm proposing is that uh, the scientific method itself that we have today does not conduce to the answers that we seek or that the ordinary person seeks. You know, you, you see a, uh, a pencil, you know, and you let go of the pencil and it falls to the floor. And people want to know, why did it go to the floor? What caused it to go to the floor? You know, you see uh, two magnets, okay? Those two little round things, they're magnets. And uh, you let go of one and it sticks to the other. And so the question is, you know, people want to know, what's the mechanism? Well, how does mother nature do this? That, those are the type of questions people want to have answers to. And the scientific method that we have today does not conduce to any of those answers. Today, we have only irrational explanations, and we've had only irrational explanations for the last 400 years since the uh, so-called scientific revolution, the 17th century. Uh, all we've had is uh, irrational uh, explanations for these things. In the case of gravity, they say it's warp space. Uh, so we have this canvas. That's the way they illustrate it. But they say it's a four-dimensional concept, time and space. That's warped, and that's gravity. And I'm not sure you, with that you can explain why this pencil falls to the floor. You know, is, is gravity is uh, space-time warped in this vicinity? And then uh, magnets, you know, they cannot tell you why one magnet attracts another from a distance. And on and on and on. So the issue is... These are the questions people want answered, uh, the common man. They don't care about equations. They don't care about, you know, uh, experiments that people did out there. They want to have answers to these simple questions. And here we are 400 years later after the so-called scientific revolution, and we don't have answers. And I'm saying that the reason we don't have answers to those questions is that um, the, the scientific method itself is flawed, or, or better yet, the scientific method that we're using today is really a mathematical method. It has to do with mathematics. And the mathematicians, what they've done is they've taken this method and turned it into the scientific method. What is it about? It's about descriptions. You observe something. Well, if you observe something, does that mean you understand it? They talk about the scientific method being the study of blah, 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 blah. If you study all week, it doesn't mean that you understood. You can get a zero on the test. Okay, so studying itself does not give you understanding. Uh, predictions. They say uh, we can predict. Yeah, with an equation, you can predict many things. I can say that, you know, if the lion runs, I don't know, at 40 kilometers per hour, in, if it, he runs in one straight line in one hour, he will be in such and such place. That does not give us explanations. You know, the fact that we can predict things. And so, uh, you know, the, the, what I'm saying is that the scientific method that we have today does not conduce to the questions that people ask. You know, I go into Quora 
or as a site that answers questions, scientific questions and all other kinds of questions. They're very good in and physics. Very interesting to see different perspectives on the questions answered. Yeah. And so the issue is people go in there and they ask these types of questions. You know, how does a magnet attract another? What does an atom look like? Why doesn't the electron fly away? And on and on and on. And so nobody gives them an answer. Everybody says, you know, here's the equation. <laughs> here's the description. And, and it doesn't go beyond that. And I'm saying the first thing we have to do is attack the scientific method. I'm saying the scientific method has to do not with what we have today, which is a mathematical method. It has to do with explaining to another human being so that that person can understand the mechanism that you propose for a given phenomenon. So if I'm going to talk about uh, gravity, I got to give you a mechanism, not so that you believe it, but that you understand it. And if I'm going to talk about magnetism or electricity, I got to show you what I mean by electricity. I got to show you the mechanism. And it's not, again, not for you to believe it. It's for you to understand it. And that's what we do with a rope model. I'm saying, you know, here we have a, a rope. Okay, let's see if I can do it this way. Yeah, farther away. And my uh, hands, <laughs> I don't know, can't get it, uh, well, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah, we see it, we totally see it. Okay, uh, here it is. Okay, so we have two atoms, which are my hands, right? And we have a rope-like mechanism that interconnects them. The two threads of the rope are exactly what make up also the atoms that are at either end. So not only are the atoms made of the threads, but those threads later on come out of the atom and uh, twine around, go to another atom, which is made of the same threads. Then on the other side, uh, we have the same two threads coming out, twined out to another atom, to another atom, and to another atom. The whole universe is simply atoms interconnected by two twined threads. That's essentially and the model. Very simple model. And the two twined and threads, uh, what are they? Uh -huh. The blue and the red? Uh, yeah, in this case, blue and red, just to distinguish them, but there, it's, it's a single thread in the entire universe. I'm saying this is the entire universe, okay? Just a closed loop thread. That's it. Mm -hmm. And this turns into every single piece of matter that we have out there. And so this is a little different than what uh, mathematical physics proposes. Mathematical physics says there are discrete particles. They're all... Uh, uh, individual, in other words, one is separated from the other. They're not connected in any way. And of course, with that model, you cannot explain the force of pull. <laughs> I cannot pull on you. If, if, if everything is just discrete particles, one particle cannot pull on another particle. And so I, I mean, think that's where it fails. That is the intuitive feeling. But uh, we could be in a universe where pulling is possible by sending, uh, sending particles. I mean, it's just, you just have to accept the universe is such that you can pull with gravitons. How do you pull with, how do you pull with particles? I, I want to see the mechanism. Well, uh, I mean, and this is what I wanted to go back to. So from the beginning of your <laughs> speech there, the distinction yeah. between mechanistic and descriptive explanations It, intuitively, it exists. I mean, I've been doing science and I was very interested in mechanism and very not interested in descriptions. However, is it a fundamental distinction? Because in the end, if you're like trying to explain the mechanism behind the car working, you're going to have the engine, you're going to have a description of the transmission, and you're going to have all, all of these parts and how they work. But ultimately, what you'll have is a description of these parts. And so is there a ultimate distinction between mechanistic and descriptive physics? And if so, what is it? Well, again, I'm saying that we need to have mechanisms if we're going to talk about the universe. Are we saying that the universe does not function according to some kind of mechanism, like a car functions according to a mechanism? Well, uh, the, the, what, I, what I'm saying is that ultimately any mechanistic explanation will boil down to a description of the mechanism, right? And so uh, even if you invoke something behind what you observe, let's say I invoke the transmission 
behind the working of the car, ultimately the description of the transmission will be a descriptive theory. It will be a bunch of mathematics that say when you have something rotating at this speed with this kind of gear, it results in that much of a movement of the wheels of the car. I will have a mechan satisfactorily mechanistic explanation of the car's working, but that mechanistic explanation will be a description of the universe. I'm saying uh, there's a difference between a description and an explanation. Those two words are not synonyms. Explanation is not description. If I, if, if I find a box on top of a shelf and I say, how did the box get up there? Okay, I want to try to explain how the box got up there. So I say, well, you know, I had a rope and it goes around a pulley and I tied the box to the rope pulled on the rope from the other side, the rope went around the pulley, and that's how I got that big box, which I couldn't lift myself, that's how I got it on the shelf. That's an explanation of a mechanism. That's different than saying the box got up there. That's a description. Yeah, but in my view... It's not an explanation. Mechanisms... And what I'm saying, what we're so, yeah. Oh, so in my view, mechanisms are meta descriptions because what you described is okay. A man took the box and went there. That's a description of a man, and presumably the entire description of all of the atoms making up the man who brought the box there uh, would be sufficient to explain why the box is there. If I say that this magnet attracts that one, and I just state that, that's a description. That's, yeah. I haven't explained but how that But even if you were to say there are little leprechauns in the microscopic okay. structure of the universe that are pushing the magnet here and pushing the magnet there, even then you'd be only describing leprechauns. No, because, I'm dis because you're focusing on the wrong aspect. What I'm saying, what you're saying in that case is, what is the mechanism? How did the two magnets come together? And now you're going to go through an explanation of that mechanism that's different than saying oh there were two leprechauns you know that that's a description so far i haven't explained anything the, the explanation has to do with the mechanism itself that's not a description again sure. description and explanation are not synonyms i think that for a given observable phenomena its description might be different from its explanation. But what I'm saying is that ultimately, the explanation is made up of little other descriptions. Yeah, but the explanation is the whole story, not the individual steps. Okay, the whole story. In other story. words, the explanation is the sum of how did this happen? What was the cause? I mean, we talk about causes, and we talk about, uh, uh, you know, what caused the phenomenon to happen? You know, what was the mechanism? And that's different than saying, I'm just going to describe a chair. You know, it's blue. Uh, you know, you can say that as part of your explanation, but you cannot say that because you say that the chair is blue, you've explained anything. All right. Uh, we that's have to distinguish between description and explanation. There are already people asking questions in Super Chats. As a reminder, you can send Super Chats and questions through Entropy, the link to Entropy is right below the, disc the video in the description. And our survey of the night is, what do you think about the rope hypothesis? Very good, interesting, or against it? We will know if the rope <laughs> passes tonight. Fractal Man has sent two super chats. His first is Bitcoin to the moon, boys. Uh, Bill Gates, you are so woke on the rope question. Uh, are you woke on the cryptocurrency question and Bitcoin? Well, I, I buy crypto also. Oh, yeah. So I'm in, um, I, I play the game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wonderful, because it's been going extremely well for crypto uh, in the last few months. There was a drop recently, and yeah. today there is a recovery. So you've been predicting that the financial system would eventually crumble. I guess Bitcoin is the way out naturally. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's a modern way of betting. Not You don't have to go to Vegas anymore. <laughs> you can do it from home. <laughs> And with this COVID, you know, lockdown, I think it's uh, perfect for a lot of people. They just stay at home and pull that, you know, one-armed bandit. 
that's another thing that people are asking about is Bill Gaid into the VAX stuff. We have learned that the Canadian protest against mandates and vaccination mandates uh, has been enlarging itself. There are now movements in Toronto, <coughs> the city of Toronto getting blocked by tractors today. Uh, there are other cities where a protest is headed, including Quebec. Um, so are you on the side of protesters there? Are you for mandates? And what do you think about the vaccine? Well, for me, it's a subject that is completely irrelevant, first of all. Uh, but uh, there's a difference between a guy like me that I'm this year, I'm going to be 70 and a guy who's 20 years old. There's yeah. a big difference. You know, in my case, I don't care if they give me a shot because I'm going to die one way or another with the vaccine or without it. <laughs> I, I don't have too long to go. You know, I don't think I'm going to make it to 100. Mm -hmm. But for a guy who's 20 years old, who has to go to work, who has to be among other people. But that guy, you know, they're scaring him on one side saying, you know, if you don't get the vaccine, you're going to die. And on the other, the guy said, well, I don't believe maybe it's maybe this is some government hoax or something, you know. And so but the guy has you know, supposedly 50, 60 more years to live. So he's got a different decision to make than I do. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. The other thing is, you know, I would have never gotten the vax at all because I don't need it. But I got the vax because I had to travel first to Iceland and then to South America. And so, and if, if you traveled, you know the kind of headaches that you have if you don't get the vax. They're, yeah. they're just going to make life so miserable for you. You might as well get it. And again, the distance, the differences between a guy who's, you know, 70 or 80 with respect to a guy who's 20 or 30. Yeah. If I was 70, I, I might get it because I would be like, maybe it's going to save me a couple of years. Uh, but you, you see through this that you've been extorted, essentially. Do, do you experience it as extortion that for traveling, yeah. you've been asked to do something to your body? Correct. Absolutely. Uh, it is an extortion any way you look at it, because when they compel you to get a vaccine or you will be locked down, you will be quarantined, you'll be having all kinds of problems. Uh, my sister-in-law, she couldn't get into a bank in South America because they said, you, uh, you know, you need a vaccine or you need some kind of uh, or PCR test or whatever. And she couldn't get in there to get her money out. <laughs> So, you know, when you get into situations like that, it's it's compelling. Yeah, absolutely. Fractal Man has sent another super chat. He says, does the string fray over time from constant breaking? And what is it composed of? So do the strings break in your theory? Uh, they're not string. We call them threads, first of all. But yeah, okay. Uh, second, um, they don't break. And third, they're not made of anything because... Um, if you go into quantum mechanics or mathematical physics in general, right, uh, they talk about elementary or fundamental particles. What is an elementary or fundamental particles? Well, right now it's defined as a particle that's not made of anything smaller. Okay. And supposedly the electron is one of those particles. Now let's go to the uh, rope model. We had, we're, we're saying that everything uh, out there is essentially a single thread that turns into atoms, ropes, atoms, ropes, so on down the line, okay? So everything in the universe is interconnected because there's, if we could untangle all of it, all we would get is a single thread in the entire universe. This thread is not made of anything because, um, it, again, it's an elementary entity, meaning it, by definition, it's not made of anything. And if it were made of something, that means that there is space between whatever, let's say it's made out of two parts, whatever they call, we'll call them A and B. So this thread is made of A and B. If that's the case, that means there's space between A and B because that's the only way you would be able to distinguish A from B. And we're saying, no, it's a single thread made of a single piece, okay? It doesn't stretch therefore, because if it could stretch, it would create new matter. And it's an elementary or fundamental entity, meaning um, there's, it's, it's the ultimate. That's where the buck stops. You know, it's not made of anything smaller that makes it up. Because otherwise people say, well, what is that other particle made of? What is A made out of? Well, it's made out of X. And what is X made out of? And it, and it keeps going and going and going, which is what you have in quantum mechanics. Now, a couple of things are emerging in my mind. And, and it's amazing because we've been talking about this like five or six shows for hours. 
<laughs> and I'm still, yeah. uh, and you know, there are questions that are totally new that we've never explored, and they're just That's popping right. in my mind. That's a testament to the idea of Bill Gates, whether you agree with it or not. It's certainly okay. a mind stimulator. So I'm starting to be worried, Bill Gates. I'm starting to be worried about your nuclei. Uh, okay. Neutrons and protons, won't okay. they blow up? with all these ropes around them, if you don't have a strong nuclear force? Do you have the equivalent of a strong nuclear force in, uh, in your model? Well, uh, we don't have a strong nuclear force because strong nuclear force is artificial, just like quarks are, are artificial. I mean, the strong nuclear force, which are the gluons in quantum mechanics, okay? Uh, uh, and their job is to keep the quarks together. In other words, they, they prevent the quarks from flying out of the proton or neutron, whichever, right? And so the issue here is the following. Uh, the quarks, uh, in fact, I was explaining this the other day that uh, the quarks uh, artificially have been given one third charge. Why? Because if you have two up quarks with one third charge, uh, I'm sorry, with two thirds charge each, you have four thirds minus one third uh, negative um, the, for the down quark, then you have four thirds minus one third, you have three thirds, in other words, one, one charge. And that's why the proton has one charge. Why does a neutron have zero charge? Because it's the other way around. You have two uh, down quarks, <clears throat> which are one third each uh, negative, and you add two thirds of one up quark, you get zero. Mm -hmm. But all that's mathematics. So the, we don't, we've never seen a quark. All that is is just mathematics to justify why the neutron doesn't have charge and the proton does. And the same thing goes with the gluons. They paint them as these little cork screws that go from one quark to another. And when you look at that, when you analyze that, they say, well, it's really a little particle that's spiraling going from one place to another. Okay, if that's the case, how does one quark attract another? So again, this gluon uh, strong force uh, it's just made up, just like the quark is made up. Just all these particles are just made up because no one's ever seen one of these. No one's ever photographed. We can't see that far in there and that small. And and all it is is just a, an accounting procedure to make sure that you know we get the, the proton being one charge and the neutron being zero charge. And I'm saying, well, what do you do with the electron? I mean, how come the electron has one charge, negative charge? You know, how do you do that with these? parts with three parts is the is the electron also made of uh you know two up quarks and one down quark <laughs> i mean well, the electron how do you is get the negative how do you the get the model. negative charge on the electron the the electron is fundamental in the model but uh so are you denying the existence or the evidence for the existence of neutrons no 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 absolutely not i'm in my case uh we just have a different model of the neutron okay. we're saying that just like the proton is the uh, convergence of threads, a neutron is a convergence of ropes. And I have a picture of that, you know, I, I could show, but <laughs> I don't have one here. Yeah, show it's you right okay. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to imagine this. So a neutron would be kind of a, kind of what happens to the atom where the threads are under, are de detaching themselves and, forming single ropes that are detached, but the neutron failed to do that in some way? Failed to do that, sorry? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, if because you say it's that. a convergence of ropes. Uh, do yeah. they arrive at the, the center of the atom? Yeah, uh, in other words, imagine, imagine gazillions of ropes crisscrossing, especially in our region where we have lots of matter. OK, mm -hmm. and I'm saying that all these ropes coming from every atom in the universe, they have to be crisscrossing somewhere in the universe. That uh, uh, convergence of ropes, wherever those happen, that's what I'm going to call a neutron. And what that neutron can do it has uh, a free and I'm going to talk about a free neutron now, one that's not inside an atom. If you see one of these uh, neutron, which is a cross point, you know, where all these ropes converge and continue going where they all cross, we're gonna call that a neutron. That neutron has the ability for one of the threads to uh, come out and form part of the electron shell, in which case, if the thread came out, all it left be within the uh, enclosure, within the membrane, all it left is single uh, threads. Mm -hmm. And that's a proton, proton star covered by a, uh, 
a um, uh, electron shell, electron membrane. And does there need to be any special event for a crisscrossing of ropes to lead to a, an observable neutron? Because it's my impression that there would be no, under this theory, there would be no particular reason to believe that they would concentrate at the middle of atoms. I, I think uh, you would have lots of atoms in the universe. Uh, in other words, just like you have many atoms, you have gazillions of neutrons. And those are inside the atoms. A lot of them are inside the atoms. They move together with the atom wherever the atom goes because they're trapped within the electron shells. Remember that. Uh, okay, it's the, the electron the atom, shell the containing the atom, the all more this. Shells it's got. So it's the electron shell containing all these neutrons in a finite space? Yeah, in other words, if you have, for example, in the center of one atom, and we'll talk about something higher than hydrogen because hydrogen doesn't have it, uh, a neutron. But you take any other element, and what you're going to have is a neutron together with a proton inside the nucleon, and that's going to be covered by an electron shell. And you can keep going with that and have more shells, depending on you know whether you have an S1, S2, or a S3 level. So you have all these spheres that are encapsulating spheres inside, which have neutrons inside So right. it's one inside of that, it's, it's, a, it's a nested system. Uh, we have another super chat. Uh, Fractal Man says, how does your model explain phase changes? Have you looked into the transition between liquid, gas, solid? That's a question of temperature. In other words, uh, temperature is a question of frequency, and frequency is uh, in, under the rope model. It's just a number of uh, links uh, that you have for a given, um, you know, uh, length of, of rope. And so you could have, for example, you know, uh, higher frequency, meaning meaning that the links are shorter, and in that case, you have heat, and you have uh, when you have the links are longer, then you have cold which is essentially the model we have today for the um, uh, spectrum. And, uh, and the same thing applies to my model. In other words, if you have two atoms and the rope that's connecting them has many links, in other words, high frequency, you have heat. And when you, the links are longer, then you, know, you have cold. Now, it seems to me that if you're, if you're, let's say you're intercepting a ray of light, So you, you have some space filled with gas or liquid. The ray of light comes in. If I uh -huh. heat this thing, does it influence the frequency of the light that's coming from outside of the place that I'm heating? Well, the, it gets the influence from the signal from the ropes that are connected to whatever you're looking at. Let's say you're looking at water, for example. Okay, So you have water and you say, well, how does the water heat? Well, the way it heats is that you have the ropes that are connected from the thing that's heating that water. They're all connected to every molecule inside that pot of water. So every, every uh, molecule that's inside the pot is connected to whatever's heating it, whatever you're going to apply heat <laughs> to. So it's got, along each one of those ropes, it's going to increase the frequency, meaning that the links are going to become shorter and you're going to have more links. And that's the high frequency that's going to stimulate that atom to vibrate faster until, you know, it heats, boils. But that's example. a description of the source of light, right? Which would be at a certain temperature. My question is, can I heat a ray of light that passes through me uh, and change the output for the observer that's beyond me? In other words, can heat influence light as it's already been sent? that's already been sent, yeah. it, what, what, the, what the atom can do, what one atom can do, if it's excited, it's going to vibrate and uh, pump at a faster speed, the quantum jump. And by doing so, it's going to torque the rope at a faster rate. And it's not that light is going to go faster. It's just that it's going to change frequency and exchange for, um, for uh, in other words, the link length is going to become shorter. Okay. And that stimulus is going to go to another atom and so on down the line. So at some point, you know, I mean, the rope is light. Uh, the, whatever goes along the rope is what we call light. And that signal is going to increase 
meaning light is going to travel at the same speed, but what's going to change is frequency in exchange for wavelength. In the case of our model, it's going to be the link length is what's going to shorten and you're going to have more links. And, that's and now I'm wondering about uh, one aspect, which is the uni thread of the whole universe. So the whole universe would be a single thread. Yeah. Uh, one of the properties of a single thread, as opposed to say, I, I could take your theory and make it a multi-thread theory. Uh, what if yeah. there was just an infinite number or close to an infinite number of threads, uh, essentially linking all atoms, that, but not being linked one to another in terms of uh -huh. beginning and beginning end. Uh, the, what is the advantage of having a unit thread? And do you realize that the feature of a unit thread is that there is a ultimate order in the, you know, in the sense that if I start from a place of your unique thread, uh, I will go through some atoms. So there will be some atoms that I will encounter before and then some atoms that I will encounter after. There will be an order effect in describing the universe. Well, the problem I have with many threads, essentially, is that, uh, and, and I have this in another context, but I, I think I can kill two birds with one stone here. Um, if if a, um, an atom, for some reason is not connected to me, I can't see it. Because the only way I can see it is through the rope that is connected from that atom to me. In other words, if there's a galaxy out there and it's not connected for some reason to me through these threads, because it's, uh, it's another system, another thread uh, system out there, I would not be able to see it. And that's why I'm saying there could be parallel universes under my model in this sense that if there's another universe next door to us, and that whole thread that makes up all that matter, none of that is connected to our thread, our universe. We would not see any of that universe. Okay. And so I'm saying that within the universe, what we see hopefully is um, everything that is connected to us, because the only way we can see is through the rope, the torsion on a rope that is connected to that atom that we're seeing. And the only way I can picture that, maybe there's someone smarter than me can come up with a better model uh, within the rope model. Uh, the only way I can understand that is a single thread. Okay, but it, it's counterintuitive to me because what you're saying essentially is that what we see, we must be connected with a rope, with the matter that we see to see it. Uh, yes. But suppose that I'm, at, I'm in a certain spot and there's kind of an obstacle hiding a star from me. If I move a little bit right, I start seeing the star. I move left, I don't see the star anymore. Are there ropes disconnecting here? Or how, how do you interpret blockades of light? I'm saying the rope goes right through the atoms that are in between your eyesight and the star. In other words, you have a star. You have something in between and you have you. Okay, So you're saying you move to the left, now you can see it because it's direct. And you say, okay, now I move and there's this other star or whatever in front of me. Maybe there's a, uh, the moon or whatever. It's in front of me. I can't see that star anymore. And you're saying, what happens to the rope? The ropes are still connected to your eye from that star and they go right through the moon or whatever's in front of you. But you don't see it anymore. So there's some, interception, there's some interception of the torque or what? Well, what you have is uh, right now, uh, let's assume it's the moon, okay? Now the atom of the moon, first of all, it's closer. Second, it's interrupting your, your field of view. And you're seeing that atom. The other one, the other row, goes in the same direction. But all you can do is see that atom that uh, comes directly to your eyes. First, because it's uh, closer by. Second, it's got higher intensity. Okay? And then it's got to do also with the molecular structure of what you have in front of you. You take a piece of paper and, or may, let's put a, a piece of cardboard and you can't see through it. And you take a piece of glass and you can see through it. And you say, well, why can I see through the glass? Why can't I see through, through the cardboard? And that's got to do now with molecular structure, not, so, not exactly with the uh, with ropes. In other words, now you got to analyze the molecular structure. But this molecular structure of the cardboard ultimately is such that, in your theory, it would absorb rope stimulus that corresponds to light, right? It right. would absorb it? It will absorb, in other words, it, because of its molecular structure, 
uh, cardboard has the ability to block light. But block light means it receives the signal, but it doesn't vibrate and relay the signal to your eye. And then uh, I was looking at a beautiful picture. I probably can't find it anymore, but, but it was from NASA, I believe. And it was the curvature of massive, I, I don't know if it was a star or maybe an entire galaxy. Somehow a structure out there in space was curving light. So much so that you were looking at this thing and you had flashes of light coming at you on top, at the bottom, on the side. Essentially, light was curving and getting to my eyes. You don't believe in that, if I remember correctly. But looking at the picture, I was like, there's a pretty convincing case here that some star behind that star is sending rays of light through the four sides, some on top, some at the bottom. And there's no other way to explain this to me than light has been curved do you believe that life or that th that light or that your ropes are getting curved okay uh, there's a little bit of explaining to do there the first problem is that under the uh, mathematics as i call it mathematical physics has no explanation for that phenomenon they talk about curved light or bending light that's not what's happening uh, even according to mathematical physics if if light is a little photon a little particle then they should talk about deflecting, not about bending. There's a difference between deflecting a ball when you play baseball or whatever and bending a banana, <laughs> okay? Bending and deflecting are not the same thing. So what these people are saying that the little ball curved around what? Around space-time, they say, because uh, the star or whatever got in, in between there pushed space-time downwards created this depression, and now the little photon ball is going to roll around or slide around that curvature. Mm -hmm. That's already an irrational explanation because they're using a concept called space-time. They're saying that time is warped, and that's how they get that explanation through. So that's the first thing we have to clarify. Under the rope model, it's a piece of cake. Very easy, very simple. Every atom in the universe is connected to every atom in the universe. We're all connected, okay? So now we have the star behind the sun. We have a little star behind the sun, and the sun is essentially eclipsing that star, okay? But that star, every atom in that star is connected to every atom in the sun, meaning it's also connected to every atom in the corona of the sun, okay? The mm -hmm. corona is the outer part, that, uh, that glow, that you know, gaseous envelope that the sun has. Every atom in the corona is tied to your eye. So what happens? You have an atom from the star behind the sun tied to an atom in the corona in a straight line because, you know, it's tight. It's, it's like this, right? Mm -hmm. so it's a straight line. And from that atom to your eye. Now multiply that times gazillions of atoms. And what you have is You've made that curvature, so-called curvature. You did it all with straight lines. It's a little bit. I, I think I've seen you. Ropes. I think I've seen you invoke this also in the case of gravity and how we are attracted to a planet, and essentially the border of the planet are pulling on the side of the object that's falling down. Is that is it's that a good parallel? It's not it's not pulling. I, I want to make sure that people understand. We use the word pull for gravity, and I'm saying it's not pull. We have to understand the mechanism under the rope model, okay? And what I'm saying, there is no pull. It's not like gravity is pulling on an atom. Uh, for example, an astronaut. He's full okay. of atoms, right? It's not they're pulling on each atom. What happens is as the uh, astronaut drifts towards the Earth, the, the ropes that connect each one of the atoms of his body to every atom on Earth, they, they open up. See, when he's far away, they're all in a single coaxial, you could say, almost in a straight line. But as he approaches the Earth, the, the ropes fan out. They, they, be, you know, they, they uh, keep, uh, they um, change their angle with respect mm -hmm. to the astronauts. So the angle is changing. And so because there are more independent ropes acting outside the, co the axis, that's, what, uh, that's the acceleration of gravity, which gives us the notion that, oh, he's being pulled to the earth. No, he's not being pulled. He drifts towards the earth as he falls, 
the ropes uh, fan out and he falls at a faster rate as more ropes participate. More ropes all, all participate when lines, you're no closer. Pull. When you're closer to I'm the sorry? planet, more ropes. Why? Because it seems because, that you're linked because, to the... More, not, you're linked... not more ropes. Not, not more ropes. More okay. independent ropes. Okay. More and, and they're how, not in the same Why action. are they independent? I'm sorry? Why, are, oh, why do they become because independent? Because of the angle. I, I, imagine imagine if, if you have... 100 ropes and I have 100 ropes. We we hold them, uh, you hold 100 and I hold 100. If you're at infinity, it's a straight line. But as you come towards me, the ropes fan out. Ah. They open, they widen out. Mm. That's yeah, what's so happening. It's a matter of kind of almost a resolution concept where if you look closer to the thing, the fact that the rope is not at the center because the center is occupied by some other rope uh, makes the, the dimensionality start to matter as you get closer. Yeah, what I'm saying, as an object approaches another, the, every atom in that object, you know, the, the, uh, if they're far apart, it's a single, it's a, 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 as is it were a single coaxial. But as they come together, they widen out, and now each rope acts independently. Mm -hmm. But there's no pull. It's just that gravitational attraction is simply a drift that produces independent ropes that are outside the axis. So going they, back they to the curvature of the light, uh, I imagine three bodies in perfect alignment. Uh, the corona of the sun. Now, I can imagine a rope linking the corona of the sun to this star extremely far from us. And then I okay. can imagine a straight line from that corona to my eye. But that to me is a triangle. That is not a yeah. curved experience of light that would make me see the star beside the corona. At best, I would see the star into the corona. What you have to do is uh, multiply that times a million because you're, you're looking at only one rope and you're saying, oh, one rope from one atom to, uh, uh, to an atom in the corona to an atom in your eye. That's only two ropes and three atoms. But if you look at the corona, the corona is, is you know, it's not even a, a flat disk. It's, it's a curvature. The, the corona is curved around the sun. Mm -hmm. And you can see certain width of that corona. So all those mil millions, gazillions of atoms there, each one at a different distance, one in beside the other or between others. You know, when you put all those atoms together or those ropes together, yes, you, you, you should see the whole sun, that whole star in the distance. You should see it, you know, uh, around the corner. So you're telling me there's a, there's a there's a there's a uh, puzzle that uh, people have that they connect they can make these curved lines all with straight lines. You know, mm -hmm. you make all these straight lines, but you put them, you superimpose them, and you create this curve. And you say, how do they produce the curve? We did it all with straight lines. That's exactly what I'm proposing. I believe that uh, Richard Feynman had something like this, maybe, but it, it was about the pat, uh, pat integrals in quantum physics, but I'm not sure it's directly related. Now, uh, so I want to understand how, are you saying that there are atoms escaping the sun beyond the corona and that I would ultimately only see curvature of light within a space where atoms have been leaving and are physically present? Or are you saying that the ropes are so packed in at the corona of the sun that essentially they have to space out and some of them will get from totally outside in empty space and eventually that's where I could see. In other words, what I'm asking is the phenomenon of the, the curvature of light as is uh, interpreted by current physics. Would it be observable in perfect vacuum or do, does it have to be some matter escaping from the corona allowing this kind of visual illusion? Are you saying under the rope model or under, yeah, under your rope physics? model? Because, you know, uh, once again, I clarify, mathematical physics doesn't have an explanation. They, you know, Arthur Eddington supposedly said, uh, I've answered the question, but he hasn't because we don't know if that little photon is rolling around. First of all, it's not bent. It's, it's uh, deflected. And then the second thing is being deflected by curved time. And that's, yeah. that's nonsense. That is poppycock. Uh, so... That, I want to put that one aside. But then under the rope model, it's not a question of atoms leaving the corona. 
I'm saying that all those atoms are buzzing around in the corona. Inside the corona. Yeah, and they're all there. It's not like one is leaving or anything. They're, they're stuck to the sun because, again, because of gravity, because each one of those atoms is connected to the main body of the sun. Mm -hmm. But you have this uh, tenuous gas, you could say, you know, this region that we call the corona. And there are millions and millions of atoms there, one behind another, one next to the other, one between another, two, and so on. There are millions and millions of atoms in there. And so, you know, if each one of those is connected to the star behind the sun that, you know, the sun is eclipsing, yeah, we should be able to see that uh, star around the corners only because of the corona. The corona is sending that signal to our eye, relaying, I call it relaying. It's relaying the signal that is receiving from that star uh, through the corona to your eye. Yeah, but you know, it, was, it was my impression that we saw a big distance between the uh, curved light that we observe and the gravitational objects. It seems to me that it's very far from the corona that we can observe the, these curvature maybe i'm wrong uh, I, I, if i remember the image there was kind of a space between the astral entity that's curving the light and the astral entity that was observed well you have to remember there are atoms uh, out there that you know that we can't really see in, in, in other words the corona itself has a gradient and there's a the outer a gradient you, you probably won't be able to see those atoms you know All i right. mean Now, uh, thinking about the, uh, the, the, I'm thinking about the sun now because we've talked about it for so long. Uh, free electrons, I believe that in the state of fusion, essentially the atoms are scrambled and the electrons are not uh, revolving around the nucleus, if I'm correct. How, uh, which form does it take in the rope model, the fusion state? The fusion of what? Well, fusion, like if, if you're in the sun, how do you model the sun? Because you were talking of atoms in the corona. Oh, oh, But my okay. understanding is that there are no atoms in the sun or they, they form only temporarily and they get eventually boiled through fusion into a state where there's a complete detachment between electron and proton. Well, uh, my model is very similar to the official model in that sense. We have a little bit of a difference, and I can explain that difference to you. Well, uh, in other words, uh, I, I agree totally that the sun uh, works through fusion. In other words, you take four hydrogen atoms, you squash them together, and you form a helium atom and release so-called energy. That's the official model. Uh, the energy that releases that, according to my rope model, is that it releases uh, higher frequency along the ropes. And that's what reaches us, higher frequency. That's the so-called energy that's being released. It's thread that's being released. But where we differ is the following. This is where we differ with mathematical physics. Mathematical physics says that because of the pressures inside the center of the sun, the particles are traveling at great speeds. That's the official version. Mm -hmm. I'm saying under the rope model, that doesn't happen. Under the rope model, it's pressure. It's not speed. It's not that, see, they're used to accelerating particles in the accelerators, and they think that that's what's happening inside the sun. In fact, they illustrate them like that, where they show that the particles are moving at great speeds, the hydrogen atoms are moving at great speeds, they're colliding, and from four of those that collide, they form a helium atom. I'm saying that's not what's happening. What's happening is because of gravity, because of that constant pressure on the center, all these atoms are just crowded in a bus and being squeezed by all the other passengers. So it's, they're fused together through pressure, not through speed. That's where we differ. Other than mm -hmm. that, my model, uh, I agree with uh, the official model on that. Uh, I just have a different interpretation of what's happening inside the sun. Is there a Pauli exclusion principle for ropes? Can ropes be at the same place at the same time? <laughs> well, uh, let's, let's first clarify that. According to Quine, <laughs> The quantum mechanics says you, a particle can be at two places at once. Now, you figure that one out. You need two beers for that one, okay, <laughs> at least. Uh, but let's go the other way around. Can two particles be at one place at the same time? According to quantum, they can, and according to the rope model, they can. So, so we don't have a problem there. We, have, we see eye to eye on that. Where's the problem? The problem is uh, how they fuse. 
In other words, uh, according to the official model, uh, the one they use, they, and then they deny, it's the planetary model of the atom. You have a proton in the center. We'll just talk about the hydrogen because it's the simplest. You have a, a, a ball in the center, and you have a little ball that goes around somewhere in, in a region known as an orbital or an um, energy level. Okay, so this little bead is somewhere in there. And what they cannot explain is why that B doesn't fall to the proton, which is positive, oppositely charged, right? And why it doesn't fly away. I mean, why does it do either of those two things? And so this little bead somehow magically stays faithful to the proton. Under the rope model, it's, it's a membrane that is encapsulating a, what I call the proton star. It looks like a star, okay? Or like, a, uh, you know, the quills of a... Uh, or, or uh, you know, porcupines that's rolled on okay. itself, okay? Mm -hmm. So all the, all the spokes are pointed outwards and that's encapsulated by uh, the electron membrane. What happens when two, for example, two hydrogen atoms come together, they blend, they merge, and they form that typical figure eight molecule, which is the H2 molecule, okay? So we have an explanation for that. We're saying it's physical, and what we're having is one membrane fuse or melt, uh, melt into the other one. They sort of screw into each other and they form this figure eight. Under the current model, the quantum model, they have no explanation. They just say it is so. What's merging? The, the two uh, energy levels, the two orbitals, what's merging? If orbitals are regions and energy levels are regions, region is a concept. You can't say love merge with intelligence. What, what does that mean? And here they have orbitals and energy levels. They merge together. They form that figure eight. What merged? So, so they don't have an answer, but, but we, we, we do it with actual membranes. We're saying the electron is a membrane. And is that the kind of the blue part of the rope, if I remember correctly, or red? Uh, those are, those are just uh, for the purposes of illustration. Yeah, uh, but there, I mean, is no there, is there one the... of the color of the rope? Is it the one that forms the electron shell? Uh, again, just to keep in line with uh, convention, we say that one of the threads goes around and forms the electron shell. We arbitrarily call it the magnetic thread because we take that from the magnetic field. And that's, again, just arbitrary, just a name, nothing yeah. more than that. And the other well, one goes through the center, and we call that the electric thread, again, because of electric field. Because I'm wondering then, if it's one of the thread that becomes the electron shell, and you're talking about the merging of electron shells, do yeah. they kind of get a record of this that would survive? say the explosion of the proton star did, 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 the, did the order of the universal thread change at the moment where there is this kind of merging between two uh, threads that are electron shells and that become only one well we need to understand how they merge what happens is you know imagine the rope okay and my my uh fists again two atoms they're, 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 that's the best I can do there. Yeah. <laughs> and what happens? As one atom appro approaches another one, the rope disintegrates. In other words, uh, undoes itself mm -hmm. until uh, one of the threads just continues going into the other, um, uh, the thread that makes the electron shell of the other atom. So what they do, they sort of screw into each other. They screw, okay, but and, they and, don't. And, and, it's, I was wondering if it was like if I was to take uh, a soldering machine and I was to uh -huh. solder two parts of your blue rope, would that be? <laughs> a, would that illustrate the process in proton stars? No, no, no. Bad analogy. Bad okay. analogy. No, I'm saying it's more like it's more like if you just take a rope, do it at home, you know, just to visualize what I'm trying to explain, not not for you to believe it. But just untie, undo it, okay? So you have the rope there, and now you're going to undo undo the rope this way, okay? We're going to undo the rope, and you can see the threads are now parallel in that case, right? Mm -hmm. Well, imagine two atoms now touching at that point. One is drawn into the other membrane of the other electro the, uh, uh, electron membrane of the other atom, and vice versa. And this one's drawn in this direction. So they, they sort of screw at the point where the ropes meet. And then the next rope next to it does the same, then the next one. And so they 
They're, they're all sort of screwing into each other, the membranes. Okay. So see. it's not it's not welding. It's like undoing of the rope as one atom approaches another. All right. BJ Beige says, if time permits, please explore Bill's time as a communist spy. Thank you for your super chat, BJ Beige. Uh, th this is something we've covered on the show back then. I don't think there is much to add uh, for now, but we'll get into the uh, the political stuff and the current geopolitical situation as soon as we can get resolved with all the questions. A lot of people have been sending questions. Human Drill says, regarding gravity, wouldn't want big rope pulling in one direction be stronger than many different small ropes pulling in different directions. I would think the angle decrease would weaken the pull. The pull. Unless the total pull of the many small ropes would be greater than the pull of the big rope. Why would the small ropes be stronger than their big rope counterpart? Uh, first of all, there's no pull. Uh, we should get rid of the word pull. I use it too, by the way, so I'm guilty. Uh, because we always talk about gravitational pull or that gravity is some kind of pull. So we use the word pull. I want to make sure that that's not the case. Okay. So whenever I use pull, it's uh, uh, don't think of pull. <laughs> okay. It's just drifting towards something and the ropes fan out. Now, if the ropes fan out, uh, it, they're always under tension. In other words, every rope is always under tension. There is no pull along any of the ropes. The rope is always uh, made out, again, uh, you know, it's just tight. It's pulled tight. But it's there is no tension. rope that goes loose. Exactly. So Except there, there when is forming an atom. Can be. And all you have within that is the speed of light, which is different torsions along each one of those ropes, because one might have an influence of one uh, entity and another one of another. So one has higher uh, frequency and the other one has lower frequency, but all the ropes uh, you know, light always travels at a constant speed. Velocity of light is little c, is 300,000 kilometers per second. That's a measure of the tension on the rope. All ropes have the same tension. So it's not like one rope pulls more than another. It's a bigger rope and the other guy is a smaller rope. All ropes have tension between any two atoms. That's all there is. And all we have is just as one object approaches another, the ropes fan out. And the more ropes that fan out, you have acceleration of gravity. I That's just realized, mechanism. as you were speaking, I just realized under your theory, Hawking radiation doesn't exist. <laughs> Hawking radiation is, is funny because uh, <laughs> they had to, you know, the, let, let me tell you what the story there is real, real quickly. It turns out that they had nothing to see. You know, they, they said to the astronomers, go look for it. Well, what do we look for? I mean, a black hole is black, you know, and the night sky is black, so we won't see anything. They said, and so they had to look for something. And so Hawking radiation came around. They said, oh, by the way, space itself is made out of particles. One is positive. The other one is negative. The black hole sucks one in and the other one is left to to be free to come to your eyes. So they say, now, now you have something to look for because there should be some radiation coming out of black hole. <laughs> but it's coming out way so too slow. <laughs> it, it's way too slow and way too weak to be observable. So we won't resolve <laughs> that one with experimentation. Uh, Men Like Gods says, Mr. Gade, I brought your name up to Alexander Unziker. And he, he said he was familiar with you, but not your rope theory. Perhaps he was confused. Regardless, I would love to hear an in-depth discussion with you and Mr. Unziker or P.M. Rabitai. Are you familiar with their work? Thoughts? Well, uh, with Anziger, we've uh, met uh, here in Germany. We met. He, he uh, came to my uh, to Frankfurt. We met. We had a morning breakfast once, and we had a lot of talk about, especially uh, when they came out with a picture of the black hole. And he thought it was a lot of baloney, and so we had a long discussion on that, a two-hour breakfast. And then we also met before that in Austria, in uh, Salzburg. Uh, we had a uh, get together there. Uh, what was it? I think 2014. We had two of them, in fact. And I think Unziger was in both of them. He was at least in one of them. And yeah, we, I know his theories quite well. He, he's, uh, he's a uh, relentless uh, critic of mathematical physics, of some of the claims that people make out there. Uh, Robitel, I'm not familiar with, but uh, I, I know who he is, but I mean, I'm I, I haven't heard anything about him. 
the photo of the black hole has been quite a, a moment that I was highly anticipating <laughs> until I saw this donut. Uh, there's something that remains mysterious to me, which is, okay, th that, that could be a black hole that absorbs light, but there is such a large ring of light around the black hole. Why is there no ring of light here obstructing the blackness of the black hole? Uh, like, if, if there is so much matter converging toward this black hole that there is basically <coughs> larger than the black hole itself, there is uh, illuminating fusion matter all around it. Why is it not all around it in a 3D way? Why can we see the dark spot? That's a question that reminds that that remains in my mind still. What is your understanding of this picture? Do you think it's just an artifact, a joke, or do you believe in it? Uh, the picture I think is real, okay, but we got to know we have to understand what we're staring at. Okay, and what we're staring at is, according to these people, okay, they should have explained it a lot better. We're not looking at a black hole. What we're staring at, according to them, is matter falling into a black hole. What we're seeing is a, a, your sink drain, you know, your drain. You put water in there, right? And the water falls into the drain. It spirals around. You can see the water, but you cannot see the drain, so to speak. That's essentially the, the case with this picture. They're saying what we're staring at is water falling into the drain, okay? And what the, what the picture is about the water falling into the drain is not about the black hole per se, according to them, because, again, the black hole is a singularity. <laughs> well, what are you staring at? Well, what, are you gonna what picture are you going to take of a singularity? Especially if it's a mathematical singularity, there's not much to take a picture of. So what they're saying is what you're staring at is not really a black hole, but water falling or matter falling into the black hole. But what I'm saying is, you can't have that because under mathematical physics, a black hole is zero dimensional. It has no size. You, you might say, Bill, you're crazy. No, no, no. Let me tell you, it has no size, not according to me. Uh, Chandra Sekhar, he got the Nobel Prize. You can look this up. Don't take my word for it. He got the Nobel Prize for proving that a black hole is zero dimensional has no size, no, no, no uh, length, width, or height. And you, had, and you had Arthur Eddington, who said, Chandrasekhar, you're crazy. He said these in the 1920s when, uh, when he was uh, Chandrasekhar's supervisor. And he said, we're not going to allow you to publish this because what you're saying is a star can collapse to zero size. And Einstein said the same thing. He says, you're crazy. You're saying that all the matter gets crushed out of existence. And that's exactly what Chandra Sekhar got his Nobel Prize for. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. Chandra Sekhar proved a black hole is zero dimensional. If it's zero dimensional, what the hell is a black hole? Well, the thing is, you, you, could you acknowledge that even if the black hole itself it would be zero dimensional, uh, it represents a, a phenomenon of gravity into the universe such that a much larger space actually is encompassed by the event horizon. I'm saying that the so-called black hole phenomena has nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with gravity. <clears throat> it's, it's the insistence of mathematicians who have not found any other mechanism that they always talk about mass and gravity. I'm saying... The black hole has nothing to do with mass. The black hole has nothing to do with gravity. This is a, a magnetic phenomenon. It's got to do with the magnetic field of the galaxy that swishes down all the threads. Remember, under the rope model, it's a bunch of threads. That's what uh, magnetic field is. And you have these physical threads, gazillions of them, just sweeping down on a star and forcing it to roll around in a, in a circle. And so they say, oh, there's a star moving around in a circle. There must be something very heavy in the center. We'll call that a black hole. And I'm saying it's got no there is nothing in the center of that orbit. What it is, is if you put a charged particle in a magnetic field, it will go around and it will go around nothing. And that's what a black hole is. Are you a secret agent of the electric universe, guys? <laughs> 
No, I wouldn't work for them. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, because they 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 seem extremely uh, motivated with their stuff, uh, with seeing magnetism and electricity as a bigger force than we typically do. Uh, yeah, but so in they that do, they, they are say, in line with you. Yeah, but no, but they're not because first of all, uh, they use the quantum model of the atom. That's where they they fail. And the quantum model is, a, is the planetary model. That means a little bead going around. And what they say electricity is, is this electron bead moving from atom to atom. And that's where we have a problem because under the rope model, electricity is not a little bead that moves from atom to atom. It's a whole bunch of merged uh, electron shells in a row and they all twirl in situ, in place. So... Their electricity is very different than my electricity. All right. William Runner says, Jeff, say hello to Bill for me. Filthy Bayuso says, is the black hole possibly what we humans call God? I don't think Bill Gates is very warm at the idea of God. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a problem with God. Good old God. I mean, uh, he's a nice fellow, but he doesn't exist. <laughs> 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 Poor fellow, you know, he's, he's not around uh, in order for God to be something, he's got to be, have shape, first of all. Then, then we can say, okay, God is something because uh, I can paint him, I can make a picture of him, I can take a snapshot or whatever. But that's not enough. If he wants to exist, if God wants to exist, he's got to have location. There's got to be distance between my chest and his chest. God Otherwise, is everywhere. God exist. <laughs> Jesus is everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, so are quantum particles. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the political situation before we conclude. So have you okay. been following this whole uh, Russia, Ukraine? It's amazing to see the American media uh, propagandize. They've been actually ridiculed by even Amer some American media are starting to question the rationality of the Biden administration. They started claiming that Putin was preparing some coup, was preparing some kind of fake video where he would make it look like Ukraine attacked him to charm people on the internet. And there's no evidence All for slag. it. It seems that America wants war with Russia. What's your take on what has been happening around Ukraine? Uh, I don't think it's the United States that wants war against uh, Russia. I think they want to create the ambient that there is going to be war. And, they, and this is a chess game. You know, it's a chess game. And again, the Americans have the whites like Bobby Fischer usually was a good attacker with his whites. And you had Tigran, Tigran Petrosian, which was the Russian counterpart. He was the good with the defenses, especially with blacks. And so this is the same. This is a good analogy for what's happening now. The Americans cannot fight Ukraine, uh, uh, it, it, this war in Ukraine, and, and say they're going to win. They don't care about that. As far as I'm concerned, they're not interested in that. This war is against Germany. This war is against Germany first and France second. Okay, uh, those are the, the targets. They want to stop this pipeline, which is, uh, is supposed to uh, the Nord Stream, that is supposedly going to be approved by June. And they want to stop that. They've been trying that for several months to try to stop Nord Stream. The Germans said no. And now they're going to use this excuse of Ukraine to say, oh, look, the, the Russians attacked Ukraine. And so now stop the Nord Stream. And we're going to pull Germany and France more to our side. Because right now, Germany and France are more or less independent of the United States. They have treaties not only with Russia, but with China. And the United States wants to stop that. I think the, uh, the United States wants these two uh, countries to be more under their umbrella. And so th this war, I think, is against Germany. Now, what happens if Russia doesn't attack Ukraine? Well, no problem. The United States wins no matter what. The United States moves its pawns, its uh, rook, its uh, knight, its uh, bishop right on the chessboard. And the other guy has to defend himself. If he doesn't defend himself, no problem. I'm, I'm going to continue attacking until at some point he's going to have to do something. And I, again, I don't think there's going to be uh, the United States is going to go into Ukraine and fight for Ukraine first because there's no treaty. Uh, Ukraine doesn't belong to NATO. 
and NATO has no reason to support Ukraine other than, you know, a pat in the back. This, this is an issue where they say, I hope you attack Ukraine so that we can justify to the Germans and the French why they have to be on our side for not only uh, being against Russia, but also against China. So this is a war against uh, Germany. This is the third world war, I could call it. And it's always Germany that loses. <laughs> oh, wow. That, that is very interesting. Very insightful. <laughs> But if you're right, and I'm Putin, then the only error I could make is to truly attack Ukraine. And so the best decision for Putin is to not create escalation, to have as many soldiers as possible to defend the current border, but not go further, not try to acquire anything in Ukraine, and make sure that Nord Stream 2 goes into function while not doing any provocation so as not to give the moral high ground to America. Yeah, but again, uh, Bobby Fischer would attack and the other guy had to defend himself. And, and he can't just say, okay, you do whatever you want. I'm just going to sit here. No, he can't sit here. Uh, Putin, the Russians in general, they have to do something. Because the United States says, oh, you're not doing anything. No problem. We're just going to move, move some missiles into Ukraine and put some troops there and it's all for fun. And so the Russians at some point will have to act. And that's what the United States wants to do, force the Russian hand. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's another take on this that you might want to consider. And that's uh, what I discussed the other day. Uh, uh, I'm saying the following, wouldn't it be nice? I mean, Russia or better yet, the Soviet Union uh, lost a lot of the countries it was Uh, you know, over uh, in the Warsaw Pact. Uh, mm -hmm. All these countries are now essentially on this side, on, on the, uh, you can call it the blue side, uh, the American side. And the only thing that remains on the other side is uh, Belarus and, um, and Ukraine, more or less. Now, the Ukrainians, they speak Russian, and uh, the eastern um, provinces essentially have already fallen to the hands of the Russians. Ukraine is not a big prize for the Americans. Again, the, the prize here is going to be uh, Germany, and the United States wants to provoke this war. But let's assume that the United States wins in the end, and not because it wins a war, but because there's an internal coup that overthrows Putin and his mafia, his group of people, okay? If that happens, and you get a friendly government in Russia that's friendly with the West, Now, that would be nice for the whole world. You know, suddenly we have these two countries, which have been enemies for so long, at least for the whole, most of the 20th century, right? And now these countries, let's assume, were friends. And now there is no enemy between, no enmity between the United States and Russia. That would be positive if we could obtain that. And if we had to choose, we would say, well, it's better for there to be a coup in Russia, uh, have a friendlier government get up there and we're all friends finally now i don't know that would be nice it's a dream but it would be nice <laughs> yeah uh that would attract a lot of hate to america the way iran for example uh, has been the victim of a coup and has been after just more hostile to america Uh, but then if America is making a war against Germany, why, why, why are they scared of Germany? They are scared of the production capacity of Germany? First of all, Germany is a competitor of the United States, like Japan is a competitor, like France is a competitor. It'd be nice if these uh, so-called competitors were neutralized and, uh, you know, they could better organize their whole production, not only for uh, manufacturing, but also services, etc. If they could organize that or, or, you know, they would all be in accord without competing against each other, but they would work in unison, it'd be a lot better for the United States, for the economy of the United States. Right now, Germany is a competitor. You got you to gotta stop that. You know, Germany, uh, whether we don't look at it that way, is an enemy of the United States <laughs> from a manufacturing uh, economic point of view. It's an enemy. And then in terms of disruptions to the supply chain, one of the big problems is Taiwan. If Taiwan is taken over during all this time, if we're too attentive to this northern situation and China takes Taiwan, we lose a source of chips, electronics. Is that therefore in the interest of the America to continue defending Taiwan? 
Well, uh, that's a tricky situation, first, because the United States is already on record saying that Taiwan is part of China. That's already in the books. So it's very hard to, uh, for, uh, let's put it in reverse. Let's say California decides to secede from the union and say, well, we don't want to be part of the United States. And China comes in the defense of California <laughs> and sends some weapons there and so on. Well, you know, the Americans wouldn't like that at all. And that's a situation that's I would love Taiwan. it. I, I would root for China and the Independent <laughs> Republic of California. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but uh, this is the situation with China. You know, uh, Taiwan, according to uh, official version, United Nations, uh, even uh, sports, China's, uh, Taiwan is part of China. Mm -hmm. And so it's a province of China and it's, it's a tricky situation. But the United States has an agreement with the Chinese, mainland Chinese, saying that, yeah, okay, Taiwan is part of China, but it, you, you can't take it by force. And, right. and that's the excuse they're going to use uh, to make sure they uh, give weapons to Taiwan and all the necessary uh, assistance for Taiwan to defend itself. Now, you're saying the uh, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, which I worked with, by the way. I worked oh, with yeah? Taiwan Semiconductor. Yeah, I did. And uh, Taiwan Semiconductor is one of the, com one of the companies that uh, supplies a l most of the chips in the world. I think it's the number one company right now. You don't want that falling into the hands of the Chinese for two reasons. One, bec one, because they have suddenly you know, control of the faucet. They can say, well, we, we, we're not going to sell you any more chips. Those chips are coming to China. And then the other one is that suddenly, you know, you gain a lot of knowledge as far as chip manufacturing, because, again, China's like six, seven years behind the West. And so they, they would gain a lot with that. But then there's the counterpart of that. And that is that before the Taiwanese lose their country to the Chinese, they could destroy TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor. Mm -hmm. or, or ship it out or throw you everything mean uh, burnt land policy burnt land in, in the sense of destroying everything and letting go of the territory uh, Russia did it many times did it with uh, Napoleon did it with Hitler they just burn you know uh, slash uh, and burn <laughs> wow <laughs> don't leave anything behind to the enemy You think like a spy. Now, before yeah. <laughs> we conclude, uh, someone had asked the question about uh, your life as a spy. Perhaps you can give us an idea of uh, maybe a story that you've been... Uh, so you were a spy for which agencies and who were you working for? I, I don't know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember Perfect. some turn coating, if I, if I remember correctly your story. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, first I approached the Cubans, okay, and I worked with the Cubans for many years, uh, what is it, 12 years, and uh, through them uh, with the Soviet Union, with the Warsaw Pact, and uh, the way it worked is the Cubans never told, told the Russians, the Soviets, right, never told them who I was, but you know, we had um, the head of the KGB, his name was Kruchkov at the time. And uh, Kruchkov met a delegation from the Cubans that went to Moscow and delivered tons of material that I had uh, delivered to the Cubans over many years. And so they gave them all this stuff. And suddenly they say, you know, this is a big coup that you have against the Americans that you've got this guy in there. But they didn't know who, who it was. Okay, they never knew. Uh, the Russians never learned about me. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that, you know, uh, well, over time, I lost my faith in communism. <laughs> uh, big mistake in my life. Yeah. What can I say, you know? And uh, because of that, I turned myself into the CIA. Okay. And they started using me in an operation against Cuba. Okay. Wow. So now they started using me against Cuba. Turns out that uh, we worked for two years with uh, FBI and yet but CIA worked with the FBI. They were together in this thing because they all were there in Texas, in Austin, Texas. I had the FBI, the CIA. We were like five people there, two from the CIA and three from the FBI. And we worked on, um, you know, providing certain type of um, information that would help them uh, penetrate the uh, interior ministry of Cuba. And what happened was that, you know, I was there working with them for two years. Meanwhile, I worked at Intel Corporation. I got a job at Intel using them as a reference. Intel found out about me, what I had done at AMD. 
they confronted me with it, said I had to uh, cooperate with an internal investigation, which was really to get information so that uh, AMD could put me behind bars for what I did to AMD. And so eventually they fired me. But before they fired me, I was able to take the Pentium, which was the number one, the state of the art chip, and took it to South America and began peddling it to Iran and to China. Wow. <laughs> countless, countless Russians may have experienced the pleasure of NES emulators playing little games on Pentium 5 years in advance, thanks to Bill's Gate dedication to information sharing. Isn't that beautiful? And you get, you get imprisoned for this. This is scandalous. Yeah, three years. I was three years in prison. Three years. Ah, oh, not so bad. Yeah. But I don't like the way the system, you know, turns against you and it decides that, oh, you have these freedoms and, oh, sharing is great, sharing is great. And then you do it and they put you in jail. That's what they do well, with the trucker convoy too. Let, let me just say one thing. I, I went three years to prison, partly because I had, uh, it, it was like this, the, here was the prosecutor and here was me. And I had my hand in the nuts of the FBI and they had their hand in my nuts. And it's who squeezed first because um, uh, they were going to put my wife in prison. That was the ah. issue. And ah, so that's how they this. had me. And I had a lot of information on uh, the FBI and the CIA. The CIA was raising national security issues. They were not going to allow a lot of that information to get into the court. And that would have gone against the FBI. I had agents filmed with, you know, and them paying me and so on. So they were in big trouble <laughs> with me, but they had my wife. They were going to put my wife in prison. So uh, even though there was no law, I had to plead guilty because it was mm. too risky. And I've seen that happen to people inside the prison, how they go after their wives. Absolutely. Bill, thank you so much for coming. I have some announcement to make solo, so I'll continue the show. It was a pleasure talking to you again, and we'll do it uh, again very soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, that was a pleasurable experience once again. Always fun to speak with Bill Gade. What an amazing man.